Welcome to the solutions to the electrostatics problem set, problems number one through four. An electron is released a short distance above the surface of the earth. A second electron directly below it exerts an electrostatic force on the first electron, just great enough to cancel the gravitational force on it. How far below the first electron is the second? If we start with the free body diagram, electron one, is being suspended by electron two, and our job is to figure out how far below the first electron is the second. Free body diagram for the top electron would be its weight down and the electrostatic force from the second electron on it, repelling it upward. Since electron one is in equilibrium, it makes sense that Fe equals mg. Fe is calculated using Coulomb's law, K, Q1, Q2 over R squared, which is equal to mg. Our job is to solve for r. Substituting the electrostatic constant 9 times 10 to the 9th, charge of an electron negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, times the other electron negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, the mass of electron 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 times the little g 9.8. Solve for r and you should get 5.08 meters. It's pretty impressive actually that it would, could be that far away and uh, suspend that electron. It tells you the strength. It indicates to you how strong the electrostatic force is. It also indicates to you how small the, the force of gravity is on a single electron because of its very small mass. Problem two <clears throat> Two identical conducting spheres are placed with their centers 0.3 meters apart. One is given a charge of positive 12 nanocoulombs, the other ch a charge of negative 18 nanocoulombs. F a, find the electrostatic force exerted by one sphere on the other. And B, the spheres are connected by a conducting wire. Find the electrostatic force between the two after equilibrium is reached. A is simply uh, a Coulomb's law calculation. F equals K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. Um, this is the three sig fig value of Coulomb's law constant, 8.99 times 10 to the ninth. It's fine to use the two sig fig value of 9.0. 12 times 10 to the negative 9, uh, taking into account nano is times 10 to the negative 9. 18 times 10 to the negative 9 divided by 3.0 meters. Um, and remember to square that. For an answer, we get 2.2 times 10 to the negative 5 newtons. Um, the sign of that force is negative, but what that, that negative sign tells us when we use Coulomb's law is that it's a force of attraction. If we get a positive sign for our force, um, it simply tells us that that is a repulsive force. So in electrostatics, positive force and negative force do not mean positive direction and negative direction, rather simply attractive or repulsive, respectively. Now, we take these two for B, connect them, and they reach equilibrium. We learned this earlier, that the charge on each would then be what? The average of the two spheres. Positive 12 plus negative 18 is negative 6 divided by 2, gives us a negative 3 nanocoulombs on each. We now repeat Coulomb's law calculation, making those substitutions for the charges, and we get a new force of 9 times 10 to negative 7 newtons. This force would be positive because each charge is negative, therefore a repulsive force. Problem number three. Three charges are arranged as shown in the diagram below. Find the magnitude and direction of the electrostatic force on the charge at the origin. Well, taking a look at this, we have a 5 nanocoulomb charge, which we'll call charge 1, at the origin. We have a 6 nanocoulomb charge out here on the x axis, we'll call that charge 2. And we have a negative 3 nanocoulomb charge down on the negative y axis, we'll call that charge 3. 
What would charge 2 do to the charge at the origin? Well, it would repel it in the direction of the negative x-axis. We will call that force F2 since it's a force due to the second charge. What would charge 3 do to the charge at the origin? Well, since it is negative and the charge at the origin is positive, it would attract it. Now, simply by inspection of the information provided in the problem, we, we right away can tell that F3, the force of the third charge on the, or, on the charge at the origin, would be stronger than F2, the force of the second charge on the charge at the origin. How do we know that? Coulomb's law is an inverse square law. We note that this charge, 3, is closer, in fact, 3 times closer to the origin than charge 2. What that means is that it, by distance alone, would be 9 times, uh, its force by distance alone would be 9 times greater than the force due to charge 2. That means just to compensate and be equal, that charge 2 would have to have 9 times the charge as charge 3. And you can see that by inspection, charge 3 is 3, charge 2 is 6, so it does not have 9 times the charge. We know that F3 is going to be stronger than F2. So drawing our arrows respectively, not to scale necessarily, but just to give us a general idea, we know that the resultant force, by drawing a parallelogram, will be closer to the y, negative y-axis than it will be closer to the negative x-axis. Alright, now we're ready to start calculating. F2, the charge of 2 on 1, would be 9 times 10 to the 9th times 5 times 10 to the negative 9. Remember to take care of the nanocoulombs with the 10 times 10 with the times 10 to the negative 9 times 6 nanocoulombs divided by the distance between them 0.3 squared. We get a 3 times 10 to the negative 6 newtons. And yes, it would be positive since it's a positive times a positive given us a positive force. It simply tells us it's repulsive. F3 would be our electrostatic constant times 3 times 10 to the negative 9 times 5 times 10 to the negative 9 divided by 0.1 squared and this would be a negative 1.35 times 10 to the negative 5 newtons. You note, however, that the sign has been left off of this answer. That is because from here on out we use common sense to determine our resultant force. F2 and F3 are perpendicular to each other. We've been down this road before. How do we solve for the resultant force? Well, we would use Pythagorean theorem to solve for F. So F is the square root of F2 squared plus F3 squared. Substituting and then calculating, you should get a force of 1.38 times 10 to the negative 5 newtons. The angle, as indicated in the diagram, is going to be the y, com the y uh, force in the y direction uh, over the force in the x direction. We take the inverse tangent and we get an angle of 77.5 degrees. So for our final answer, F is 1.38 times 10 negative 5 newtons at 258 degrees. You can use the 77.5 degrees, but you have more to write if you do that. 77.5 degrees below the negative x-axis, for example, would be, would, would be a, an answer that would work. If you want to just express it just as an angle, give the true angle relative to the positive x-axis. Lastly, number four. Three charges are arranged as shown in the diagram below. Find the magnitude and direction of the electrostatic force on the 6 nanocoulomb charge. I'm going to show you a method by which to do this. If the numbers aren't nice and clean like they are in this problem, we'll see if you pick up on anything here, and we'll leave that for discussion in class tomorrow if you find some easier way than what is being shown in this video. 
we have a 6 nanocoulomb charge that is 0.5 meters on the positive x-axis, a 3 nanocoulomb that's 0.5 on the positive y-axis, and a 2 nanocoulomb that is 0.5 on the negative y-axis. Our job is to find the resultant force on the 6 nanocoulomb charge. Well, we know because uh, charge 2 and charge 3 is equidistant from charge 1 and charge 3, and all are positive, so charge 1 is going to repel charge 3 in the direction of force F1. Charge 2 is going to also repel charge 3 in the direction of force F2. By inspection, we know that F2 is going to be greater than F1. All charges are equidistant from each other, but charge 2 has more charge than charge 1. That gives F2 a slight advantage, a slightly stronger force. And by drawing a parallelogram, because of that, we know that a resultant force, we should get an answer that's in the fourth quadrant with a sm probably a small angle um, below the positive x-axis. Let's see if that pans out. We go ahead and we calculate F1 using Coulomb's law, K times 2 times 10 to the negative 9 times 6 times 10 to the negative 9 divided by, this would be, uh, I believe, root 2 times 0.5 and then square that. Okay, and doing that we get 2.16 times 10 to the negative 7 newtons. For F2, K, Q, 3 times 10 to the negative 9 times 6 times 10 to the negative 9 divided by the same distance squared gives us 3.24 times 10 to the negative 7 newtons. So we were right by our inspection. You notice that F2 is greater than F1. Now, <clears throat> to handle a problem like this, um, we now want to take each force and break it and use the method of rectangular components to solve for the net force. So I've developed my chart here. The X component and Y component of force 1 would be 2.16 times 10 to the negative 7 times the uh, cosine of 45 degrees for the x component and 2.16 times 10 to the negative 7 times the sine of 45 degrees for the y component. Likewise for our F2 x and y components it will be 3.24 times 10 to the negative 7 times the cosine of 45 degrees 3.24 times 10 to the negative 7 times the sine of 45 degrees for the y component. Remember that the force 2 is in the fourth quadrant, so it has a positive x component and a negative y component. We now calculate the components of the resultant force. We add these two to get 3.82 times 10 to the negative 7, and we add these two, which in reality means we're subtracting them to get a negative y component of 7.61 times 10 to the negative 8. From here, we do Coulomb, I'm sorry, Pythagorean theorem to get the magnitude of the resultant, since these two components are perpendicular to each other. We get 3.90 times 10 to the negative 7 newtons. We then do an inverse tangent calculation to get the angle between them. 11.3 degrees. And if you actually truly did that, I believe you're getting negative 11.3 degrees. Taking that all into consideration, our final answer, 3.90 times 10 to the negative 7 newtons at 349 degrees from the positive x-axis, or you could say negative 11.3 degrees. We all know that that's negative, that's 11.3 degrees below the positive x-axis. Alright, um, more to come as we complete problems 5 and 6 in class tomorrow.